Well, look, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, I've got to start off with a little bit of a warning. I took about three weeks off caffeine, and this morning I've had four cups of coffee. So if I get going in one direction and it sounds like it doesn't make any sense, someone just start waving to me. I think it might have um, been five, honestly. Yeah, it yeah. might have been five. I blame Charles for that one. He had the coffee brewing this morning. Um, no, but it, <laughs> in all honesty, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And I was thinking about what to say to start it off. Um, and I was first thought was, we're so lucky to be here. But luck really doesn't play a factor in, in, into why we're here because everyone's here with intention. Everyone's here for a reason. So, so luck is really not the right word. It's, it's really we're fortunate to be here and fortunate to have people like Will Harris and Slim who are mission-oriented people um, moving this message in the right direction. So th thank you guys for putting this together, and it's a pleasure to be here. Woo. I mean, I think the only thing that I could possibly add to that is so Harry and I were fortunate enough, we got to speak at the Colorado conference at Jason Rick's Ranch, which was an unbelievable event. And then we were fortunate enough to be able to do a wrap up episode on our podcast just to talk through that three day weekend, everything we learned, the panels, the sessions, uh, it was myself, Harry, Slim, Charles, and then Jason. And we were just trying to figure out like, how do you capture, how do you put into words kind of like the magic that was formed over those three days? Like, and magic or faith or spirituality, like those were the three things that we just kept coming back to um, because you just walked away from the experience just trusting that, you know, we were do we're all here to do something that's greater than yourselves. So when Harry and I were thinking about how could we help to maybe capture some of that magic in Georgia, um, similar to Colorado, we were just thinking about things that we could do. And we were thinking, oh, maybe we could do a PowerPoint deck. Maybe we could do a deep dive into nutrition and fitness and leave you all with a playbook we were like, that's not really what we do. We don't think that that could be as impactful as possible. We thought maybe just coming up here, sharing our honest stories. We both had some pretty interesting journeys from unhealth to health and ask, asking and answering some questions that have helped us the most on our journey. And we think that these questions and answers could potentially help everyone in the room. So that's really what we're, we want to do up here for the 30 minutes that we have. Yeah. And um, maybe just before we get started, by show of hands, how many people have tuned into our podcast? Just curious to see. Oh, that's awesome. Um, well, many of many of the people in the crowd have actually been on our podcast. We had Slim as our first guest. We had Jason Rick. Um, we've had Tristan Scott um, and, and many others uh, as well join us as guests. So, um, you know, it's exciting to see some familiar faces around here. Um, and also, you know, I, I think our podcast is built upon the guests that we've had. So thank you guys. Um, I think without further ado, let's dive right in. So our story starts with some some uh, humble beginnings around health. But I think before that, we were both college athletes. And uh, a few years after we graduated from college, found ourselves both dealing with different types of health situations. So Brett, I know you, you dealt with an autoimmune issue uh, a few years after college, uh, fighting you know, to get your health back. Can you talk about that journey, that process for you in terms of where you were in those days when it was you weren't in good health and then what you've done since then to get you to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, to keep in mind, like everything that we're trying to do with the meat mafia, it's born out of like our friendship and just our mutual love for nutrition and trying to help get people healthier. So, you know, we don't have MDs. We're not nutritionists. We're not personal trainers. We're just two people that have had our own experiences through nutrition and have gone from really unhealth to health. Um, so for myself, you know, I battled some pretty serious autoimmune conditions. And for anyone that was in Colorado, I apologize to repeat the story. Um, but everything that I did growing up, I just justified it that I was a high level athlete. Um, you know, I drank the protein shakes. I drank the pre-workout. I felt like I could kind of eat whatever I wanted because I was burning so many calories. Um, I had amazing parents that cooked me all of my meals, like provided for me amazingly, but I never really thought about the role nutrition plays in your health. So I ended up playing baseball with Harry at Babson College, which is a small little Division three school. And in 2016, when I was 21 years old, that's when I really started to have some of those serious health issues pop up. Um, I was living at home with my parents in New Jersey, and I was working an internship in New York City. So as part of that internship, I would take the train two hours in, I would go to work, and then I would come back. So it was about like four hours total. And I started noticing on those train rides, I started having an increased urgency to go to the bathroom. And so I didn't really think anything of it. 
And then a couple weeks go by, I start noticing blood in my stool. I'm thinking to myself, okay, this isn't good, but maybe it will just go away naturally. And that's like a lot of times what happens with some of these autoimmune conditions or irritable bowel syndrome. We just let things go on too long. And like the first thing is that if you notice, if you're noticing blood when you're going to the bathroom, like you should be immediately getting on top of that and get it checked out. Um, so I did not do that. And I let the summer continue to go on. My symptoms got worse and worse. And then by the end of the summer, I was literally going to the bathroom like 20 to 30 times a day, straight blood. Um, I lost close to 30 pounds. And the last day of my internship, I actually, I couldn't keep any food down for weeks. And I ended up getting rushed uh, from the building to the hospital, got hospitalized, um, got a colonoscopy, and then I got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Um, and then for anyone that doesn't know what ulcerative colitis is, it's an autoimmune disease. It affects like 600 to 900 thousand people. Um, it's very similar to Crohn's or IBS. It's all in that family. Um, so anything with itis just means chronic inflammation. And that's really what I had. So colitis is, uh, it's an autoimmune condition where your, your large intestine, and your colon from all the stress, from not giving your genes and your body what it actually wants, it starts to develop these bloody ulcers through like the severe inflammation. So you can't hold down any food. So that's why people that get sick with Crohn's colitis, IBS, you lose so much weight because you're not processing anything. It's just kind of going right through you. Um, so as part of that, what they tell you is that there's no cure for all these autoimmune conditions. They can put it into remission. That's the best they can do. Um, but you're going to have to be on these drugs and medication for the rest of your life. Um, so for me, I went on this, uh, this immune suppressant drug called Remicade, um, and I would get it through an IV every eight weeks. And it costs $50,000 per infusion too, which is crazy because for me, that's about 400K for the medical system let alone all the other people with some of these autoimmune conditions that need to go on Remicade. So like you can do the numbers on how much that actually adds up. Um, and I, I, and the, G, the GI, the gastroenterologist that I went to, he was a very good guy. Like he had great bedside manner, but I specifically remember diet, lifestyle. Like we didn't talk about any of that stuff. It was just immediately, you know, going on these drugs and I would have to be on it for the rest of my life. So I finish up school. Um, I get out, I start working in New York City. And just living on my own, that was probably the first moment where I started to take my health into my own hands. And what I mean by that was I was fortunate. I got to live with a great roommate who was really into fitness. He was cooking a lot of his own meals. I didn't cook anything. I have an Italian mom. So growing up, I cooked absolutely nothing. Um, but he was like teaching me very basic dishes like ground beef, steak, chicken. And I noticed cooking my meals. I was like, okay, there's a correlation between cooking my meals and my symptoms are going away a little bit. Um, and then everything changed for me in 2019. And the reason why I say that is that I stumbled upon uh, Dr. Sean Baker appearing on Joe Rogan. And for anyone that doesn't know Sean Baker, he's probably the most well-known carnivore doctor. He was, uh, I think he was an orthopedic surgeon or he was an emergency surgeon, incredibly accomplished athlete. And his whole theory is that we've evolutionarily evolved to be carnivores and we thrive off animal products, primarily beef, chicken, eggs, pork, fish, et cetera. And that beef is actually the most, some of the animal products are some of the most nutrient dense bioavailable foods that you can put into your body. And for me, that was counterintuitive to everything that I heard. Cause I had heard that red meat causes cancer, diabetes, all these other hosts of heart attacks or all these other hosts of uh, misinformation that we all know in this room, not to be true. Um, so I listened to that podcast and then I started researching the carnivore diet and I started noticing that there were all these people that had Crohn's, colitis, IBS, rheumatoid arthritis, eczema, all these autoimmune conditions that are claiming that they're curing their disease when there's apparently no cure. And so that's when all the, the bells went off in my head because that I started saying to myself, all right, if it's possible for me to heal naturally and get off medication that has this whole other host of side effects, why would I not do that? So I very vividly remember in 2019, going to the Whole Foods in New York, um, going to the local grocery store, getting all my beef, my steak, chicken. Um, I lived in this tiny little shoebox apartment. So I like, I had no idea how to really cook. So I was smoking out my apartment and everything like that. But that was like, that was the entry point. And I said, look, I'm going to do this for two weeks. I'm going to eat all animal products. Um, I'm going to drink bone broth. I'm going to cook with butter and we'll see where we're at. I can do anything for two weeks and let's just give it a shot and see what happens. And so literally after those two weeks, I went from going to the bathroom probably five to six times a day down to one to two max immediately. So for me, I'm thinking to myself, okay, here's actual proof that my controlling my dietary inputs is directly impacting the way that my stomach feels. 
And then from there, it was just building on momentum like anything else. So I start cooking more of my meals. I start sourcing my stuff more intentionally. I start signing up for endurance races, half Ironmans, Ironmans, triathlons, eating the right way, telling all my friends about it. And then I'm sitting here in 2021 and my stomach feels as good as it's ever been. And so part of the thing with colitis, Crohn's, IBS, you have to get a colonoscopy every two years just because you have an increased risk of getting colon cancer from all the inflammation. And I had done a lot of research and I was confident that I was ready to get off my medication. I wanted to make that plunge and not be dependent on the medical system. So before going into that procedure, I said to him, I said, look, you know, is there anything that we can do to get off of this medication? Because I feel like I don't have any inflammation and I would like to try and explore not being dependent on this drug for the rest of my life. So he said, look, we'll go in, we'll do the colonoscopy. And then if your stomach looks good, we'll experiment with it. So I go in, I get the procedure. And not only did I not have any inflammation, I had zero microinflammation at all. So because of that, he was, he was, I was the first patient that he had ever had where he got me off of this Remicade drug. And that was a little over a year ago. And now we're sitting here a year later and completely drug free, feel better than I've ever felt. Um, so it's just a, you know, it's a testament to the power of food and nutrition. And a lot of our goal with what we're trying to do is, you know, we want to make these stories less and less and less uncommon. We want people to continue to experiment with their diet and not just necessarily take everything that your doctor is saying at face value, which is what something Mike has said. You know, we want to help teach you to be the CEO of your own health and experiment and iterate and see what can happen to you because, we, you know, the, the body is an incredible thing and the self-healing powers of it are unbelievable. So, yeah, man, when, I mean, when I hear your story, I always think about that line that you say, which is be the CEO of your own health, take ownership. Um, you're responsible for how you feel. And uh, I, I want to hear you talk about a little bit more about that mindset, the process in which it took you to really start thinking for yourself and start to say, I need to really fix this. Otherwise, I'm going to be on this drug the rest of my life, potentially. Yeah, I would say. So I started cooking some of my own meals and I was always before I really got into the nutritional space. I was just, I just felt like I wanted to be a normal person, whatever a normal person meant. Like I still wanted to drink alcohol and go out and eat and things like that. Um, and then we were supposed to do a race together. We were supposed to do a half Ironman together in 2000, right before I started going down this rabbit hole, like early 2019. And I had to miss that race because I had my first flare up since I really got sick again. So that was kind of like the catalyst that pushed me over the edge to figure out like, this is just not a way to live life. And there has to be an alternative medic measure to just being on medication and just continuing to eat this standard American diet. So I would say that was probably the trigger. But then also when, when I was going through the process and, and, and then Weldon and I were talking about this yesterday, there's like a spiritual component too, where you have to actually believe that you can heal, right? So it's like, you can do the diet, you can try these different measures, but I don't know if it's like, whether it's a higher power or just this mental shift of saying, look, it is capable for me to heal. You have to have that mental shift too. So it's not just a physical thing. Yeah. I think there's something to that as well with like the self-experimentation aspect to getting healthy. A lot of people are reluctant to just take a step outside of the conventional way of thinking and really yeah. start to embrace different principles around health. And that makes me think about the existing paradigm that we live in. The, the modern health system is basically, or modern food system has left 88% of people in a metabolic, uh, metabolic dysfunction. And so if that's the paradigm we're living in, uh, that system is not working. And so you're, you're kind of a product of, of some of that. And not to say you, you clearly did have control. You, you took your, your health under control, but um, it's just, I think, a great reminder of all these, you know, you can do it. You can make those steps. It's just a matter of getting in front of the right information. Totally. And I think our stories play off of each other pretty well too, because we were saying, you know, we wanted to touch on my story just to bring the autoimmune angle to it. Cause I'm sure everyone here probably knows someone that has an autoimmune condition I think it's 25 million Americans have it right now, which is, you know, if you look at a graph, it's like within the last 50 years, they're just skyrocketing. It's the highest it's ever been. Um, but I think your story is more relatable than mine. And when we talk about experimenting with some of these changes, I know in the beginning of COVID, you had found yourself in kind of this like slow decay almost, and you were really ready to make a change. So I think talking through some of that stuff could be helpful. Yeah. Uh, the 30 pounds you lost, I put on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so... I was, working, uh, I was working a job in real estate after school, um, high stress job, you know, within the first 18 months to 24 months of my career, I just kind of lost my athletic nature of, you know, always being in those positive, healthy habits, going to the gym, eating right. You know, whenever I'll go to the bathroom, I would grab some Oreos, grab some Doritos. Um, 
you know, I blink and one day I'm like, dang, I do not look like an athlete anymore. Um, and you know, that didn't sit well with me. So then COVID happened and that was kind of the, the jolt that I needed to, to start taking my time and energy and focusing it on things that were gonna, actually going to help me. And so I started, uh, you know, in, co- in college, I was very, very focused on the performance side of things. So really like spent a ton of time in the gym, but nutrition was something that I experimented with, but uh, kind of grown divorced from a little bit. And then, uh, you know, COVID happens and I start working in this ketogenic diet and just eating animal-based foods, exactly what Brett's talking about, cooking all of my meals. I'm a huge believer in uh, this idea that nutrition and health in general is simple, but it's not easy. And so I try to speak from the John Wooden school of thinking, which is focused on the fundamentals. So I'm like, I'm going to just buy all my own food, cook all my own meals, bring all this back in house. Clearly, whatever I'm doing right now is not working. Lots of grazing and snacking uh, that might work for cows, but it doesn't work for me. So I, um, you know, I, I really started to see changes happen really quickly, started sleeping more, started feeling way better, lost 25, 30 pounds within the first four to six weeks. And at that point I was off to the races and haven't looked back since. I mean, we ran an Ironman last year and all of that was rooted back to that moment in time, those four to six weeks where I was just being very intentional about what I was doing and just focusing on these basic fundamentals of of what being healthy really is. So getting more sleep, you know, I used to commute an hour each way to work and got that back in my back pocket during COVID. So I was able to get a little bit more sleep, able to cook all my meals, you know, we were locked down and, and all those things were kind of just forced upon me. But at the same time, you know, looking back, I'm like, okay, those are good habits um, that, I, that I started to develop. Did you very intentionally just focus on the diet as the one thing that you were going to control to start? Yeah. The only physical activity I was doing at the time was uh, going outside and getting long walks in. So I wasn't running at all. I was like, just going out. My sister's a huge walker. So we got in like a little bit of a competition. I was going out, I was walking like 10 miles a day, just trying to get as much low level activity in and really just focusing all my energy on cooking. So, I definitely saw you walk like 26 miles on your Strava too one day. <laughs> you gotta get competitive. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, I think um, there's really something to the simplicity aspect of it. And, you know, speaking to that point, the, the, food system now, there are are billions of dollars out there trying to tell you that there are quick tricks and, you know, magic pills and formulas to get you healthy. And uh, that's might work in the short term, but I think the long term plan is getting back to the basics and the basics for us, what, what we truly believe in is eating real foods, focusing on those bedrock habits, like getting your sleep, um, focusing on low levels of physical activity and really focusing on that energy in the kitchen. So trying to cook more of your meals. Um, and once you get those things down, you can build a ton of momentum over time. What do you think were the most bang for your buck foods that you started to incorporate where you really started to see the best effect from incorporating them, you know, in your diet? Yes. Simple is not sexy, but I would, uh, I would eat a lot of ground beef, a lot of eggs. Um, I would find ways to make those flavorful through putting some fermented veggies in there, some pickles, uh, different types of peppers in there. So it wasn't always the same taste, but I would say that probably made up like 60 to 70% of what I would, I mean, what I was cooking. And then, um, another thing that I dove into was slow cooking a lot of my meals for meal preparation. So I got, uh, really big into like chuck roast stews, um, cause I could make a massive amount of food and just eat that throughout the week. So I think that that type of thinking where, Hey, I'm going to prepare for the entire week in one day, or at least like a few days ahead of time, I'm going to have, you know, four days of of food prepped on Sunday was a big mindset shift for me as opposed to kind of just going to the food court at my, uh, at my job. So, yeah, I feel like one of the things that I love about your story too, is it's a good reminder that you shouldn't let good or progress like kind of get in the, you know what I mean? Like have perfection get in the way of being good Oh, totally. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I think too many people try and be too perfect. And there are a lot of people on social media that I don't think do a good job of teaching the right message. So there's people that say, oh, you know, if you're not immediately eat, eating grass-fed, grass-finished, or eating like testicle or liver, you're on the JV team or whatever. 
And that's just like so counterintuitive to what we believe. It's like now I've come awake to how amazing grass-fed, grass-finished beef is grown from your local farmer. But when I lived in New York and I was 23, I could only afford, you know, ground beef that was conventionally raised at the grocery store. But my justification was that it's still better than 99% of the crap that's in the inner aisle of the grocery store, where it's all just combinations of corn, wheat, soy, it's controlled by 10 companies. So even just doing that and eating that, that still really helped get my health in the right perspective. And then the more that I've dove in and rolled up my sleeves and researched, you know, you find your local farmers, you find your places to source your beef from, you throw, start throwing in bone broth, start throwing in tallow. Maybe you start off just doing like a 10 minute walk after your meals and then you build up to a mile or two miles. And the reason why we talked about the Ironman is not like, oh, we did an Ironman. It was more so like, no, I remember in 2017 when I couldn't do five bodyweight squats and I couldn't run two miles, I've, we've built ourselves up to be able to do some of this stuff. So it's all about that constant progression and recognizing the fact that like you're never going to be perfect and that's totally part of the process, but you can get to be really freaking good if you just keep coming at it every single day, show up to be a student and take your health seriously. Yeah. It's not and, a dress rehearsal. And I think at, at this point, we've really talked about what we've added uh, into the picture of becoming more healthy, but there's certain things that by adding more animal foods, you're also eliminating some aspects to uh, food that's in a lot of, you know, the standard American diet uh, foods that are produced. So yep. maybe you could talk about some of the, the pillars of, of health and sort of how you frame thinking around like, you know, seed oils, sugar, grains, um, and how to avoid those. Yeah. I think sometimes instead of just adding to the equation, like you said, subtracting is incredibly valuable. So I think we live like we live by a very simple philosophy and it's just eat real foods grown in nature. Like Micah was talking about, like Mr. Will was talking about. And so our definition of real foods is it's meat, it's fish, it's eggs, it's fruits, it's vegetables. And it's not our business to tell you, oh, you know, you need to do a carnivore diet or you need to do a ketogenic diet or you need to do Mediterranean or plant-based. Like what we think is that if you're eating any of those foods and shifting away from the processed crap that's in the inner aisle of the grocery store or going to a restaurant where they're cooking it in inflammatory seed oils, you're gonna feel better. And it's a self-experimentation that's really important. And part of the reason why I'm saying that is um, I remember eating a lot of meat and I was eating a lot of dark leafy greens because I was told that those were healthy for me, a lot of cruciferous vegetables. And I was finding that I was really bloated and I didn't feel great. And so I kept a food journal where I would log everything that I was eating. I would you know, write down how many times I would go to the bathroom, how did my stomach feel? And I started noticing, okay, when I'm eating these dark leafy greens that I'm told are being healthy, they don't sick rate. So I cut those out and immediately my stomach got better. Um, so the point of me telling that story is like the self-experimentation and just the tinkering is huge. But if you can just start eating these single ingredient foods that are actually you know, grown in the ground and require strong effort to make, I know that that's something that you've taught a lot about is like the energy that goes into actually harvesting beef from ranchers. Like that's an indication that you're eating really good quality food. Something in the inner aisle of the grocery store, it's, it's scientifically engineered to taste good, to manipulate you and be incredibly cheap and easy to make. So that's like a good indicator that your food is good as if it's requiring energy to produce it. Yeah. Another indication is if it goes bad quickly, it's probably pretty good for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think we've, unfortunately lost is uh, in the process of trying to feed the world, foods become very fast and cheap. And that, that is, that's changing how the food is made and how we actually enjoy the food. So, you know, we've got people who are spending, you know, trying to cost optimize and, and uh, you know, they're, they're going to buy the synthetic fertilizers and have all the different input costs that go into raising their cattle and uh, you know, that's, you know, that's their way of living, you know, no, no harm, no foul, but it does, you know, it does affect, uh, you know, the production of, you know, specifically production around corn, soy, and wheat, and those funneling into all these highly processed foods in our grocery stores and, you know, just popping open of a bag of something that's uh, quick, uh, easy, and cheap and lacking in the nutrients that we really need. We're no longer spending the time, you know, sitting around a dinner table as much. We're not having the conversations, the cultural aspect of food. And so that how we raise our food is directly being translated into how we enjoy food, which I, I, I think comes before uh, the changes that happen in terms of what we eat. Like, you know, how we enjoy food is, is fundamentally important to our health, uh, who we share food with, um, the conversations we have around food. 
I think all of those raise the stakes and make you actually want to have, you know, a good meal, a good conversation. And uh, that's kind of a nuance that we've lost through making our, che- our food cheaper, faster, and more affordable, which again, there are some positive externalities to that, but I, I do think that it's, it's good to hold both of those um, aspects in mind when talking about food. I know something I wanted to ask you. We were talking about this when we were walking just up and down the road when we were preparing for this. We were talking a lot about like one of the common pushbacks that we get is just price of doing a primary animal protein diet, whether it's keto, whether it's carnivore. And I know that I mentioned before, all I could afford when I was 23 was grocery store beef and it helped push me in the right direction until I could get to the grass fed, grass finished. But we were talking about how instead of viewing these things as costs, we really see them as holistic assets. Um, so maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah. When I, when I hear you say that, I think back to our podcast with Joel Salatin and he mentioned a statistic talking about, you know, our, our budget, a hundred percent of our budget, about 30% of it goes towards food costs and healthcare costs combined. And over the past several decades, food has gone from being about, uh, 20% of that 30% stack down to 10%. And then the healthcare cost has gone from 10% to 20%. And I think that's perfectly indicative of how we need to shift our paradigm in thinking around food, which is like, this isn't just the cost of your food. It's also the cost of your long-term health. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be the person who's not stuck in the system of constantly going to the doctors and figuring out what, you know, the different issues that are coming up with the different complications related to their health, um, making those investments, you can, you can justify making those investments in the food long-term. Yeah. We, we definitely have a tendency to fixate so much on the price of meat in particular, right? So like, if you're going to go buy ancestral grant ancestral blend ground beef, I have friends that would be like, why would I ever pay 12, $13 for ancestral grand ancestral ground beef? And from my perspective, I'm like, I look at these things as a holistic asset, right? So an asset is something that's going to help you produce income over time. And I view that the same thing as your health. So it's like, yeah, you can continue to eat the same stuff and go to Burger King and you can go to McDonald's and heat up your meals or whatever. And maybe you're paying $7 a meal, or I could choose to pay a few extra dollars for the best quality protein that God has created for us. And I could nourish myself and my family. And I also think too about the the, the positive effect of just having more energy in your life when you get yourself to a spot of good metabolic health. So for like a father or mother in here, the ability to like have that extra energy to play baseball with your kids or throw the ball around with them. It's priceless. It's literally a priceless yeah. investment yeah. in your health. Um, and also if you are eating meat based, you're now avoiding all the crap in the inner aisles. And I hate to keep coming back to that, but it's like, I just don't believe that it's more expensive. Like I, I for me in San Diego right now, I don't have a great local farm out there. So I literally go to the farmer's market every Sunday. I have it averaged out that I eat like 14 pounds of beef. I go to the local um, rancher right out there and I have like throwing a bunch of different cuts. I'll throw in roast chicken, I'll throw in ground beef, I'll throw in steaks. And I'm really not paying that much for my meat and it's gonna nourish me and it tastes delicious. And I have a relationship and they know what my preferences are. So they'll throw in those special cuts of meat and they, they're actually incentivized to want to take care of me. Whereas like a big four packer, they'll never, they don't know who you are. You're literally just a number to them. Whereas like you, you walk around this farm and Mr. Harris and his team can literally tell you everything about the lineage of that cow. It's just a different level of autonomy over the food you're putting into your system. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the idea of shaking your rancher's hand, which is something Slim talks a lot about, uh, is important and it helps you gain that appreciation, you know, maybe you weren't the one out there raising the animal, but at least you can have the appreciation for what, what went into raising that, that, uh, that animal. And, you know, you're going to spend the time to prepare it and enjoy it properly. So uh, that's another component of that as well. Totally. And I think to, uh, put a bow on the conversation, you know, for people that are here for ourselves, from your perspective, what do you think we can do to, you know, leave this conference and actually have like a lasting impact to not just absorb the information and leave it here, but to actually take it out into our, you know, our towns and our lives around the country. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, th- I think the idea of starting with yourself and starting with your local communities is very important. So if you're concerned about your own health, um, getting access to the, the right information and trying to make these simple, small steps for yourself and build some momentum is key. And so if you're interested in taking action, um, start small, uh, start by incorporating things that are really going to make you feel your best. Um, 
you know, we talk about this all the time, like eat, eat to feel good, eat for satiety. Um, there's foods out there that are, are, are just kind of traps. And um, I think people get caught up in, in a lot of the, the different, you know, kind of three pillars of, of uh, destruction to your health, which is refined grains, refined sugars and refined oils. And, um, you know, if you can avoid those and focus on the things, uh, you know, basically anything that you can pull off a farm, your health is going to dramatically improve. So I just think, you know, kind of setting up a plan for yourself and, and being willing and, and uh, willing to take the chance to experiment a little bit can go a long way and just play the long game. You got to make small change over time. It's not going to happen overnight. Beautiful. I have nothing to add. That's beautiful. Thank you, uh, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs>